is there a way that we can purposefully create the perfect remix for any context, for any situation? And what would that take even look like? So can we create a shape-changing song that customizes itself so that more and more people actually engage with I that song? Take song you know. So if I happen to be going to the bar, I'll hear the dance version. These guys, you know, he's, he's chilling at home. He wants to hear a more jazzy version. She's going to the gym. She wants to hear the drum and bass version. So can we do that? What does that look like? What if it shape changes itself to the person listening to it? So depending on your mood, depending on the time of day, depending on um, the kind of genres you like, on anything, the song itself could adapt itself to you, to your acoustic environment, to your heart rate. Uh, in the current class of 2017, last year's program. Um, we had a, uh, Lars's company, Weave, they make adaptive music. That's a new music experience. It's music that's remixed on the fly based on your biometrics. So if you're running down the street, you're going for a run, listening to music, every foot falls on the beat. All of your, all of your action and your heart rate and your intensity is driving the way the music is, is synced to your, to your activity. In about 2016, the Google team, the Google Brain team, um, they did a whole lot of work around speech recognition. There was the rise of GANs, a whole lot of new neural networks. For the first time, we could start to understand raw audio. So first, to understand what we're trying to do, let's, let's look back at the paper from last year called WaveNet. It's a, a paper that's trying to learn to generate audio from audio. It's actually learning on the raw PCM, pulse code modulation, the raw speaker cone position sampled 16,000 times a second. And it's trying to predict the next sample conditioned on about the last two seconds of samples. And what it uses is something called dilated convolution. So you see the arrows, they get spread further and further apart. It's almost like they're being dilated in time. So that the, 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 the next prediction is conditioned not only on the sample that came last, but some samples or some um, representations of samples that happened further and further in the past. And this allows WaveNet to be able to make, um, make predictions that have a little bit of coherence. And a whole lot of breakthroughs in neural nets in the last couple of years gave us a chance in three directions. One, a huge abundance of data is now available to researchers. Uh, that combined with some really clever gamers worked out that you could use GPUs that are on graphics cards to enable you to do really high-speed really high computation that wasn't normally available. That combined with, that enabled them to have a whole series of breakthroughs, first with image processing, so to do image detection and machine translation, so language translation. So this is playing out over the last three or four years. I'm going to play you AI music. I'm not sure if you've all kept up, if you've been following it, but what I'm trying to show you here is it was really shit for a long time <laughs> and it's got a lot better in the last two years. And it seems to be accelerating through a whole series of breakthroughs. And it's not just us in the music tech industry who are doing it. The tools we use are exactly the same tools they're using in self-driving cars. It's exactly the same tech that they're using for all of the other things. We just ride along. As long as you're good enough as an engineer to understand what the hell those guys just did, you can take it and apply it to your domain. It's all shared problem space. A lot of this is sequence prediction. Music's a fairly sequence prediction thing. When I play this note, what note's most likely to come? And if you take a whole lot of music and you pass it through Markov chains, you can develop the probability of every note following every other note in the sequence. And you can make music. Or you can make something that sounds like music. And this doesn't sound like music, but it kind of does. Yeah. The very first, 1959. <laughs> And what's missing there, that it sounds kind of music-ish, but there's no, there's no localised structure, there's no repeating patterns, there's nothing that we would define as being melodic, it's just making stuff that's kind of sound. And if you try really hard, it can make sound. 989, the first neural net has a go. So Markov chains are considered old school machine learning. This is at the very start of, again, at the very start of someone goes, hey, neural nets could be cool. So neural nets are... A deep learning model that are inspired, they're not like our brains, but they're inspired by our brains, as in they're kind of anal analogous to how the brain works with, with uh, synapses connecting and passing messages and storing potential across nerve endings, all of that stuff, in a very simple way. This is the first neural net version. So this guy's taken bark music, trained it on that bark music, points it at us and says, play something that bark, sounds bark-like. And the big breakthrough there was immediately 
you can hear local structure. This is starting to sound like music. That's 1989, and then 1994, Mark of Chains are revisited, and someone, an artist in the US, David Cope, had the idea of, well, maybe if uh, we enforce rules, and there's, this is the very start of the early... Um, the battle between supervised and unsupervised learning. Supervised learning being, well, we already know some of the rules of music. You should play in key. You know, you should, we should understand notation. Let's build those rules into Markov chains so it sounds a lot better than it did before. So this is the first of those attempts. Trained on a whole lot of Chopin. Jump forward to the neural net era, 2016. And a lot of you probably have heard this one. This is the famous people as well. This is the Sony CSL team in Paris who released a song called Daddy's Car. Then there was a land rush. IBM, as they love to do, on the, quickly on the back of that, started to release their own music from Watson at the same time. not a human performing this, this is AI performing this, which was a big breakthrough. If you're a musician, you can hear how much more expressive it is than the other music that came before it. And then 2017 also, uh, a startup that we worked with in LA called Ampa have raised the bar again and they're of the, they're continuing in the Sony CSL tradition where they are doing supervised stuff. They encode as richly as they possibly can the rules and laws of music into the software itself. When Stephen talks about they do uh, supervised and rule-based stuff, what he means by that is they have gone out and created a library of sounds that are matched to rules around music. These keys, these progressions, these chords, these notes map to these feelings, these sounds, these instruments, these emotions. What you're about to see here is pretty cool. This is Taryn Southern. She's an Instagram uh, celebrity. She's got about 10 and a half million followers, I think mostly in the US and Western Europe. Um, and she went on her own, self-served, ampermusic.com and made music and made music and made music and revised it and revised it and revised it till she liked what she got, downloaded the clips, put them into Ableton or Tractor or whatever and edited them into songs and sang over top. So what you're about to hear is a pop song that she released um, that's got several million plays on YouTube, uh, has been featured on CNN and, and Fox in the States, um, and is entirely, uh, from a musical perspective, created by AI, though edited and arranged, and then lyrics written and, and sang over top of it by a human being. And this is probably the state of the art from a hit song it standpoint. Is, yeah. Yeah. I wish I could see beyond what I can see. I wish I could touch beyond what I can touch. I wish I could feel beyond what isn't real. I wish I could imagine, imagine. There's more to who we are There's more to what we could be As I feel the weight of being I'm learning how to break free I'm breaking I'm breaking free I'm breaking down I'm breaking free 
this is a demo. Oh, this is a. This, this is, is back to Francois in Paris. Back to Francois, and we, we're going to hit France, who's the very first to do this. And this is like six years ago or so. He's programming neural nets to play along with other people. The backstory to this guy, in the last month or so, he works at Spotify now. That's right. Spotify headhunted the whole Sony CSL group, and now who knows what they're doing at Spotify. So this neural net's trying to listen and play with him, or what happens next is actually what's happening. Yeah, this is a continuator. If you play this, what happens next? That piano's playing itself. Yes, we call our AI Alice. It stands for uh, something nerdy. I don't remember. I don't remember what they named it. What you're going to see is, is Angus is one of our software engineers. He's going to play, and Alice is going to predict what he's going to play next. So this is about four weeks ago, and it's still call and response, and it's only quite a short video, but you'll see it's improved quite a bit. So you're going to see Sean's now playing. So this was on Monday afternoon, Monday morning. His, what he plays is on the bottom, like a representation of keys. Alice is playing at the top. And now it's no longer call and response. They're playing off each other. So that's uh, completely unsupervised. It's trained on a whole lot of... Uh, about 8,000 classical songs is all it's ever heard. And we take that and we split it into small fragments, millions of pieces, um, and it's using a, a, a causal convolutional net, which means that we are basically turning it into images and we're looking at it and going, oh, yeah, I've seen something like this before. This should be the next bit. Sony Music, Q Prime, Warner Music, Harmonics, um, Silva Artist Management, Bill Silva Entertainment, right? These are some of the um, most highly leveraged uh, companies in music and they can, they can both open doors and test products and validate companies in ways that we can't on the venture side. Um, and we can validate companies technically and organizationally and from a venture perspective in ways that they can't. And if you put those two things together, that's quite a bit of leverage to send a company out into the market for future fundraising. If you're using a computer algorithm to create music that is the ultimate in terms of being familiar to people and what they've already liked, what's going to happen to that familiarity curve is that you're going to start at a point and drop off a cliff every single time because everything will end up sounding like everything else that people already know. And as Chris was pointing out, what actually makes music perfect is the, the stuff that you can't necessarily factor into an algorithm. It's the oh my God, where did that chord sequence come from? Where did that sound come from? My God, what have they done with that lyric? And that, for me, can only ever come from human beings. And it's also the human beings that are the people that are listening to the output of music as well. So remember, you know, we're not robots, we're not computers, and I don't know that music can genuinely be written by an algorithm in a computer. <laughs> 